Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. This morning, we'll continue where we left off in the broadcast yesterday with the reading and discussion of the book, The History of Romanism by John Dowling. Yesterday, we concluded at the, tw- the, the top portion of, of uh, subsection 64 on page 305, where the woman and the beast are together going to persecute, prosecute, and extirpate and annihilate God's true people in the south of France. The woman, the whore of Revelation chapter 17, and the beast upon which she rides, that is the emperor Frederick II, the civil government, is going to join forces to kill God's people. And when they do it, they'll think they're doing God's service. Now, yesterday we concluded with the reading of the edict that Frederick VII, the beast at this time, was the, this edict where he was going to dedicate the forces of the state to forcibly uh, kill the Albigensians and the Waldensians, the Protestants of that era. And here is his edict. Quote, The care of the imperial government, says His Majesty, committed to us from heaven and over which we preside, demands the material sword, which is given to us separately from the priesthood, against the enemies of the faith, and for the extirpation of heretical pravity. Okay? Heretical pravity is Protestantism. Those who protest the Antichrist the whore, and the beast, okay, against the enemies of the faith, that is the Roman Catholic faith, and for the extirpation of heretical pravity, that we should pursue with judgment and justice those vipers and perfidious children who insult the Lord of his church as if they would tear out the very bowels of their mother. We shall not suffer these wretches to live who infect the world by their seducing doctrines, their Protestant doctrines, let me just add. They infect the world by their seducing doctrines and who, being themselves corrupted, more grievously taint the flock of the faithful. Okay? Listen, the Protestant message was being received in the south of France. People were leaving the Roman Catholic Church in droves. They were coming to, to the knowledge and understanding and love and appreciation for Jesus, the head of the church. And they more and more began to see the Pope for what he is, the Antichrist. The Protestant movement was well underway in the south of France. It was becoming Protestant, and it was a grave threat to the existence, the survival of the Roman Catholic Church. And so the Roman Catholic Church got together with the civil powers of the of the continent, the Frederick II, the, the emperor, and they waged a crusade against these godly people. Now, at the bottom, the last paragraph on the bottom of the page, it says, in a second edict, after comparing the Waldenses, <clears throat> these Protestants, to, quote, ravenous wolves, adders, serpents, etc., the emperor proceeds to accuse the heretics of the most savage cruelty to themselves. Quote, since, in the words of the edict, since besides the loss of their immortal souls, they expose their bodies to a cruel death, being prodigal or careless of their lives, and fearless of destruction, which by acknowledging the true faith, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, by acknowledging the Roman Catholic Church, they might escape. And which is horrible to express, their their survivors are not terrified by their example. Okay? So these people were absolutely committed to telling the Protestant message. 
no matter what threat the Pope and Frederick II issued against them. No matter if they were going to be burned at the stake. Even if they were burned at the stake, which many, many were, their families and those who observed their, their cruel execution in the flames were not intimidated. It says their survivors are not terrified by their example. These people willingly gave their lives as a testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. We don't find that kind of faith today. Okay, we don't find that kind of conviction today. Why? Because nobody knows who the Antichrist is. Nobody can protest against him because they don't or will not accept who he is. They either don't know or they're doubtful, and in which case no one would jeopardize their lives. But these people were certain. They knew precisely who Jesus Christ was their Savior and Redeemer, and they knew just as precisely that the papacy was Christ's counterfeit. And he was destined, he was destined to, to uh, uh, corrupt the truth. Okay? That's his purpose in the world, to corrupt the truth <clears throat> and to turn the gift of God of salvation into a sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church. That salvation wasn't available through Christ alone. It had to come through the church and through the Pope and through his priest by participation in all the works of the Roman Catholic Church called the sacraments. Okay? And that not only was it not only, it was not any more free, but it had to be bought with either service to the church or money or whatever else that the papacy could gather up. Okay, indulgences. All right, they turned the gift of God into a lie. Now, they were fully right in their protest against the Antichrist, just as we are fully right to protest against the Antichrist and to do it without fear, even at the risk of our own lives. Now, he continues, he says, against such enemies to God and man, we cannot contain our indignation, nor refuse to punish them with the sword of just vengeance, but shall pursue them with so much the greater vigor, as they appear to spread wider the crimes of their, stu their superstition to the most evident injury of the Christian faith and the Church of Rome, which is adjudged to be the head of all churches, unquote. So, who does the beast work for? The whore. The Roman Catholic Church. The beast, the scarlet-colored beast, the one who sheds all the blood, the one who carries the sword in the name of the church? You're beginning to understand Revelation chapter 17, aren't you? very vivid color description of this union between the Roman Catholic Church and the governments of the world and how they work together to kill the saints of the Most High. Okay? This is history. It happened a millennium ago. And it's still happening today. Now, why do we to the future for the quote-unquote great tribulation. It's all part of the, the uh, deception. Okay, this is why this, this history is so valuable to us. Now, continuing, he says, by the same edict, it is enjoined that strict, uh, that strict inquiry be made after these heretics. Okay, they're going to be put into the inquisition. And they're going to be asked a lot of questions. Okay, this is interrogation. Everyone is going to be subject to scrutiny. You know, anymore we don't have to sit in front of a judge of, uh, of priests or, or the secular power. All we have to do is tap something out on our keyboard, and everything that we think, do, and say 
is registered with the the NSA. Okay. We don't have to go to the Inquisition to be interrogated. We're interrogated as we as we as we uh, speak into our cell phones or change a channel on our television to show our preferences or shop online or write an email to a friend or visit a certain website. That's all known by our government. Okay, the Pope never dreamed of having the technology that he has today to interrogate the people, to find out who are the heretics and who are not. Okay, so he says by the same edict, it is enjoined that strict inquiry be made after these heretics, and that after examination by the prelates, that is the priests, a circuit of priests who were convened to interrogate heretics, if any be found to err in a single point from the Roman Catholic faith, they are, in the case of persevering in their error, condemned to suffer death by the flames and to be burned alive in public view, while all are forbidden under pain of imperial indignation at the threat of the the entire weight and strength of the imperial government to intercede in their behalf. So these people are going to be rounded up. They're going to be questioned. They're going to be convicted of heresy. They're going to be burned publicly alive in the streets. As as an example to the whole world, what happens to you if you protest against the Roman Catholic Church and against his priests and his sacraments and against the beast that carries her? Okay, this is a perfect union of church and state, where the Roman Catholic Church controlled the state. All right? The woman who rides the beast, do you suppose she leaves the beast to wander wherever he wants to take her? No, she controls the beast. All right? So the whore, that who, that who worships a, 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 a false god... Okay, she's whoring around with a false god. It's not a Christian church. It's a papal church. And that's why she's classified as a whore. This is always used as a, typically in the Bible to describe an apostate church. Whoring around with all the other gods. <coughs> Bowing down and worshiping images and idols. Okay, so she is vividly described as a whore in Revelation chapter 17. And this civil power, in this case, uh, Ferdinand II, is uh, uh, the beast. The woman and the beast. All right, he says, by the same edict, it is enjoined that strict inquiry be made after these heretics, that is, after true Bible-believing Protestants, And that after examination by the prelates, if any be found to err in a single point from the Roman Catholic faith, they are in the case of persevering in their error, condemned to death, to suffer by the flames, and to be burned alive in public view, while all are forbidden under pain of imperial indignation to intercede in their behalf. If anybody stepped forward to try to save these people, they'd be bound with a to the stake right along with them. So says the emperor, Ferdinand II. It says, The emperor also, by these decrees, so pleasing to the popes, declared infamous and put under the ban of the empire all who shall in any way receive, defend, or favor these heretics. In other words, if you were to say one word in favor of these heretics, you were under the ban of the entire empire. There was no place you could go. They would pursue you just like a heretic. And it says, From this specimen of the spirit of the secular powers in that age of popish triumph, it will be easily understood what was likely to be the fate of those who were delivered up by the priests for punishment to the, quote, sentence of the secular judges, unquote. Okay, the purpose of the secular judge is that during this period of time, you know, you walk into any courtroom today, you see secular judges. 
They wear black robes. They have golden bars on their sleeves, depending on, the, on their rank and uh, their affiliation. But during that time, they served the church, the Roman Catholic Church, the whore of Revelation chapter 17. The secular judges were just uh, the, the executing authorities of the civil power, that is, the scarlet-colored beast. Now he says, the arrangement by which the priests delivered up their victims to the vengeance of the secular powers under the hypocritical pretense that the church abhorred the shedding of blood. Okay, can you just imagine this? All this bloodletting lies at the church's doorstep. God knows why these, the lives of these people were destroyed, and to whose blood is their, is their blood accredited. It is to the papacy, to the Roman Catholic Church, even though it was the secular power that carried the sword of the church to kill these people. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 18 tells everybody to get out of the church. Okay, Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins. What were her sins? Killing God's people. So if you're in that Roman Catholic Church and you don't come out, you're going to be commanded to kill God's people. Come out from her, my people, that you partake not of her sins and that you receive not also of her plagues. That's right. The Roman Catholic Church is going to be recompensed for all the blood of the saints that she shed over the thousands of years. Okay? that you partake not of her sins, and that you receive not also of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven. Okay? Now, you've heard all kinds of estimates of how many hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions that the Roman Catholic Church is guilty of killing during this, this time. But you can argue until the cows come home about how many there were. The Bible tells you that her sins have reached unto heaven. Now, whatever number that is, it piles up all the way to heaven. So it's not a matter of numbers. It's a matter of fact that God has taken notice. The crimes of the Roman Catholic Church have, sended, uh, have ascended all the way to heaven. And God hath not forgiven her sins. All of her sins are remembered. Every single one of her sins have been remembered. They have not been forgiven. Okay? What does that tell you? There's no grace for the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because they reject Christ for the Pope. They reject God's law for the Roman Catholic canon law. And, they for, and they've forsaken God's grace for sacraments, none of which can take away sin. And that's why her sins have reached unto heaven. And God hath remembered her iniquities. It says, The arrangement by which the priests delivered up their victims to the vengeance of the secular powers under the hypocrisy hypocritical pretense that the church abhorred the shedding of blood was an arrangement by which, in the words of Dr. Jordan, quote, the priest was the judge and the king was the hangman. Okay? Now, in biblical terms, we would say the whore is the judge and the beast is the hangman. The scarlet-colored beast is the hangman. All right, but, but don't miss the point. It's the Roman Catholic priests who were the judges, and it was the civil powers from the emperor right on down to the publican in the, in the cities were the hangmen. That's the scarlet-colored beast upon which the whore rides in Revelation chapter 17. Now he says, but we shall proceed the following chapter to a narrative which well illustrates the manner in which those princes, that is the kings of the earth, 
were treated who hesitated to perform the office of hangman for the Pope and his minions. Okay? What happened if one of the kings of this earth over which the pool the over which the Pope ruled, if they were careless in carrying out his executions or refused to execute the quote unquote heretics, that is Bible believing Protestants, what would happen to them? What would the Pope do to a sympathetic uh, civil leader, a, a civil ruler who did not pursue with vigor these godly people? We're going to see an example of that. This is chapter, uh, chapter 8 on page 307, if you're following along. It's entitled, Pope Innocent's Bloody Crusade Against the Albigenses. Under his legate, the ferocious abbot of Citeaux and Simon, Earl of Montfort. Okay, subsection 65, we begin. He says, about the close of the 13th century, in consequence of the increase of heretical Waldenses and Albigensians, particularly in the south of France, the Pope's legates, Guy and Rainier, were dispatched from Rome for the purpose of extirpating these heresies, that is, to extirpate the heretics, and armed with papal authority committed to the flames a, number, a large number of them at Nevers in 1198 A.D. and following years. These efforts, however, were attended with so little success that Pope Innocent III, whom we've already had more than one occasion to name, found it necessary to resort to more vigorous measures. Okay, The crusade wasn't going along so well. So Innocent III had to resort to extreme measures. He proclaimed a crusade against these unoffending, defenseless people. That is, God's people. Defenseless and unoffending and he dispatched an army of priests throughout all Europe, not just France, but all of Europe, to exhort all to engage in the holy war against the enemies of His Holiness, the Pope, and the Roman Catholic Church. So now it's not just in the south of France. This is a continent-wide crusade called by the Pope against godly people, Protestants. He says, as these papal emissaries traverse the kingdoms of Europe, we are informed by the learned Archbishop Usher that they had one favorite text, a biblical text. You'll recognize it. It's Psalms chapter 94, verse 16. Quote, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unquote. You see how Satan uses God's own words to justify his horrors? It says, And the application of their sermons was generally as uniform as their text. Quote, You see, most dear brethren, how great the wickedness of the heretics is, and how much mischief they do in the world. You see also how tenderly and by how many pious methods the Roman Catholic Church labors to reclaim them. But with them they all prove ineffectual, and they fly to the secular power for their defense. Therefore, our Holy Mother the Church, through the great re reluctance and grief, calls together against them the Christian army. And we'll continue with the prayer, with the, the the sermons preached by these Roman Catholic priests during this time. We get back from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
years ahead of the dominant media. FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio. My personal snail mail address is P.O. Box 304. Jefferson, Iowa, 50129. My email address is tom at cwaves.us, and the website is inquisitionupdate.org. Now, the papacy invokes Psalm 96, verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? And who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Obviously, the papacy presents himself to the world as God through invoking Psalm 96, verse 16. This is blasphemy. Flat out blasphemy. The Antichrist is invoking Psalm 96, verse 16, claiming himself to be God on earth. And he is using Psalm 96, 16 to conscript a continent-wide military, a continent-wide militia to pursue God's people. And together with this invocation of Psalm 96.16, the priests go all over Europe with a sermon. And the sermon goes something like this. You see, most dear brethren, how great the wickedness of the heretics is, 
and how much mischief they do in the world, you see also how tenderly and by how many pious methods the Roman Catholic Church labors to reclaim them. But with them, they all prove ineffectual, and they fly to the secular power for their defense. Okay? Okay? These heretics fly to the secular power for defense. They think the scarlet-colored beast is going to defend them when she, in fact, carries the whore, the Roman Catholic Church. All right? The sermon continues. He says, Therefore our Holy Mother, the Church, though with great reluctance and grief, calls together against them the Christian army. Okay? We're going to have a Christian army. We're going to conscript a Christian army from every reach of the empire to go against these heretics. And if any member of the civil power, any member of the scarlet-colored beast that carries the Roman Catholic Church, if they're reluctant to join this crusade, never mind. They will come under the ban of the church, too. Okay? So there's no one going to be excluded from this crusade. Everyone's involved, and everyone is going to risk their salvation and their lives if they fail to kill these heretics. He says, therefore, our Holy Mother, the Church, though with great reluctance and grief, we just hate to do this. Oh, we're so sorry to have to do this, but we must. We must call together against them the Christian army. And then if you have any zeal for the faith, that is, for the Roman Catholic faith, if you have any zeal for the Roman Catholic faith, if you are touched with any concern for the glory of God, that is, the glory of the Pope, you must understand, if you would reap the benefit of this great indulgence, come and receive the sign of the cross and join yourselves to the army of the crucified Savior. Unquote. So the Pope has just issued a continent-wide indulgence. If you have any un- unconfessed sins, If you are a prisoner in a penitentiary doing penance to the Roman Catholic Church and the civil power for some crime that you've committed, no matter how heinous, your crimes will be forgiven you. Your sins will be forgiven you. You will not be required to perform any uh, penance if you join the crusade. In other words, the gates of heaven will be thrown open for you no matter how criminal you are if you join this crusade. I, the Pope, the voice of God on the earth, will remit all of your sins, will cast open the pearly gates, and when you approach those gates, St. Peter will step aside and curtsy and bow when you walk in, if you join this crusade to kill these Bible-believing Protestants who say that Jesus is the Christ and the Pope is the Antichrist. Does it make sense to you now? You know what? I've been watching some videos lately on YouTube. I won't give the man's name, but he's very popular. He's part of the uh, Flat Earth group. But he's got this theory that the Antichrist, the future Antichrist, he doesn't believe that the Pope is the Antichrist, the papacy is the Antichrist. No, he's, he's a futurist. And he believes that the future Antichrist is going to be a genetic clone of Nimrod. That's right. During, during Desert Storm... Somehow, the United States military found, uh, I think it was in 2003, according to this, uh, this author, this YouTuber, that the U.S. military found in 2003, I recall, the grave of Nimrod. 
and they seized it. And they also seized all of the ancient uh, encrypted writings that were held in the Baghdad Museum and that all of these ancient writings were have, that the United States confiscated had to do with resurrection. And the implication of this YouTuber is that we, the United States, is now in possession of the DNA of Nimrod. And we have all the ancient writings about resurrection. And that we're going to clone a, a, a genetic clone of Nimrod, and he's going to be the Antichrist. Let me tell you something. The Protestants were absolutely right. The Antichrist is no genetic clone of Nimrod. The genetic clone of Nimrod sits on the throne of the Vatican. It's the papacy. You've heard me over and over and over refer to the Pope as the modern-day Nimrod. That's exactly what he is. The Protestants were absolutely correct. They identified the papacy as Nimrod. They identified the papacy as Pharaoh. They identified the papacy as the man of sin prophesied in the scriptures, the Antichrist, the little horn. And history has proven it beyond any argument. Now, I don't deny that the United States might possibly have the DNA of the ancient Nimrod. And I don't even deny that they might possibly find a way to clone him. But guess what? He's not the Antichrist. He was an Antichrist, and if the United States and the Vatican use this clone of Nimrod for any other purpose, it will be to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews for one week, and in the midst of the week, he'll renege on that treaty. And he'll be taken out of the way. And then the Pope will ride into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass, and everyone will hail the Pope as the representative of Christ on the earth. The Pope's not going to have it any other way. Now, I've suggested that the Pope can use anyone, even Mickey Mouse, to sign that seven-year peace treaty, <coughs> and the whole Protestant world will believe, and they will not take any other word from anybody. They will believe that that person is the Antichrist. If they continue in this futurist belief Whoever signs a seven-year peace treaty offers a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews to allow them to begin building their temple and offering sacrifices and eating and drinking damnation to themselves, once again proving that they do not receive the blood of Jesus, but they, re they, they, they must make sacrifices just like the Roman Catholic Church does. Once that man is taken out of the way, the Pope is free to hail himself as whatever he wants to in this world. And the Protestants will gobble him up like he was God. That is the error of futurism. That is the consequence of futurism. That the whole Christian world bow down to the Pope of Rome. The Antichrist of Scripture, History, and Prophecy. You see why so many times I'm filled with emotion about this? Look, the consequences of being mistaken about who the Antichrist is are incomprehensible. And virtually every member of my family is prepared to believe a lie. There's not one exception that I'm aware of in my family, my own personal family, on any side, whether it be the family of my father, the family of my mother, 
the family of my stepfather, the family of my wife. There is not one member of any of those families that are not right now prepared to believe that whoever puts up a seven-year peace treaty for the Jews, he is the Antichrist. You won't be able to convince them otherwise. <clears throat> Once that treaty is signed and that man is, is revealed, there, there won't be any words in this world that will change their minds. They've been prepared for it all their lives. They expect it, and they even pray for it. They pray for the Jews to build a temple. They think the establishment of the modern nation state of Israel is God's work. They believe the Jews should build a temple and make animal sacrifices, which is nothing but what they did after Jesus was crucified. Having rejected Jesus, they were bound by Roman by 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 Jewish law to offer animal sacrifices. They did not accept that Jesus was the sacrifice, the supreme sacrifice to which all other sacrifices pointed. They rejected Jesus and they had only one hope that they continue in that Temple Mount worship to offer sacrifices of lambs and goats to the God of heaven. Sacrifices that can never take away sin. And to prevent them from continuing to eat and drink damnation to themselves, God used the Roman Tenth Legion to destroy that temple and to level it so that not even one stone remained upon the other. But my family and every member in that family, no matter from what side of the, of, of the family tree you look, they're all anticipating a rebuilt temple and the reinitiation of animal sacrifices for the Jews. <coughs> you can't get more deceived than that. Jesus is the sacrifice. And if you make any other sacrifices, whether it be a piece of bread in the Roman Catholic Church, whether it be a lamb or a goat or a dove on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, if you make any sacrifices in India, if you make any sacrifices in China, if you make any sacrifices in Russia, any other religion on the planet, you have eaten and drunk damnation to yourself. You have denied the Christ that bought you. And Rome would have the whole world participate in the sacrifice of the Mass. And that's what they're going to do. That's been Rome's intent from the very beginning, to get the whole world to eat and drink damnation to themselves, to make other sacrifices than that which Christ offered himself 2,000 years ago. Jesus confirmed a covenant with many for one week, the 70th week of Daniel. And in the midst of that week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. No more sacrifice for sin. If you sin willfully after you've received the knowledge of the truth, there is no more sacrifice for sin. You have but one, and that is Christ. And if you offer another sacrifice for sins that you commit after you've, you've, you've received the love of the truth, you've denied Christ. You've counted the blood of Christ an unholy thing. You have rejected His blood. Now, you see how dangerous it is to say that the future... The 70th week of Daniel is yet future. You're essentially saying that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. Because Jesus' sacrifice was made during that 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. When you say that the 70th week is future, or any portion of that 
prophecy is to be fulfilled in the future, you've denied that Jesus fulfilled them 2,000 years ago. And his fulfillment of those, ten, of, those, of those things in that prophecy proves that he is the Messiah. In other words, if you believe in the 70th week of Daniel, a seven-year period in the future, you've denied the blood that bought you. You may profess that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the living God, that He died for the sins of mankind, and because of His stripes we are healed. But you turn right around and say the 70th week of Daniel's future, you've contradicted yourself. Now choose you this day who you're going to believe. Are you going to believe Daniel, or are you going to believe that false prophet behind the pulpit of your church? You see, they they believe and they teach the lie that the Roman Catholic Church has taught for 2,000 years. That the Antichrist is not the Pope. The Antichrist is in the future. And so now, because they all believe it, they're ecumenically joining the Roman Catholic Church. They believe the same lies. They ought to, be, they ought to lie in the same bed. And you know what else they're going to do? They're going to lead the Roman Catholic Church in a crusade against God's holy people. Horror of horrors. That these futurist ecumenical evangelical bellies are going to see those of us who are trying to tell the truth as heretics. And they're going to join a global papal crusade. And when they kill us, they're going to think they're doing God's service. If they do not repent, they will be in the Roman Catholic Church. They will be not in Christ, but in the Pope. They will participate in her sins, and they will receive of her plagues. Plagues that by that time will have thoroughly reached heaven. God isn't going to forgive their iniquities. He's going to remember them all. Does anybody have any questions? If you have questions, email me. Tom at seawaves.us Tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s Do you understand why I cannot help but raise my voice to the point where I get laryngitis? Can anybody say that I've erred in the Scripture in my assessments? Can anybody say that I've erred in my understanding of history when I make these assessments? Can anybody say that my passion is misdirected? Can anybody say that my anger is not just? If you have a comment, criticism, email me, tom at seawaves.us. I want to know. I'd like to know if there's even anybody still listening. But the Pope said, and if you have any zeal for the Roman Catholic faith, if you are touched with any concern for the glory of God, if you would reap the benefit of this great indulgence, come and receive the sign of the cross and join yourselves to the army of the crucified Savior. Do you realize that not before long, this same edict will be reissued against the Protestants? Subsection 66, the reigning count of Toulouse, the province of France where these rebels against the papal authority chiefly abounded, these Waldenses, the count of Toulouse was Raymond VI, a man who had either too much policy or too much humanity willingly to engage in this war of extermination against his unoffending subjects. Here's the case of Raymond VI, the Count of Toulouse, one of the provinces of southern France, 
who couldn't help but love the Protestants. These inoffensive, peace-loving, charitable Christians, Bible-believing Christians, harmless, industrious, an asset to the country, both in temporal terms and in spiritual terms. He just couldn't lift a hand against them. No matter if the Pope and the Emperor charged him to do so. In the year 1207 A.D., Raymond the Sixth was required by Peter of Castlenau, a legate of the Pope, to sign a treaty with other neighboring provinces to engage in the extermination of these heretics. That's right, a, a legate of the Pope, Peter of Castlenau, forced Raymond to sign an allegiance, a treaty with other provinces in the south of France, other countesses, counts in the south of France, to come to his own province, Toulouse, to engage in war to kill these people. <clears throat> he was forced to sign a treaty, an alliance, with these people to come to his, his, his county, his, his uh, 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 province in the south of France, to engage in war. He had to sign a treaty that these crusaders would come and wreck his country and to kill the most innocent people in his country, the most industrious people in his country the least troublesome of all the people in his country. Raymond knew the consequences. His province would be destroyed by war. And the cream of the crop in Toulouse were these about against which this crusade would be fought. Raymond had to realize that his province would be destitute, a smoking ruin, and God's people would be absent from it if he signed that treaty. We'll be back tomorrow. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, 
when the third temple is built. That's crossthebordor.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crossthebordor.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthebordor.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordor.org.